of the blatantness of them, you know, saying that they were doing one thing uh, to make the matters better, but in the end, they weren't really doing doing things. And I think the re- recent uh, whistleblower uh, with Meta and Instagram and kids' mental health really shows that they know what's going on, but they chose not to to act. I'm Isha Da Vinci. This is the Grift Podcast. My goal with this podcast is to help us all get ready for the very different world that we're living in and the strange new future that lies ahead. A big part of that is understanding and taking control of our toxic relationship with technology. And by that, I mean big tech. We need to know what goes on behind the scenes and exactly how we're being surveilled, controlled and exploited by the tech giants. Today's guest is going to help us do precisely that. Tom Kemp is a Silicon Valley-based entrepreneur, investor, and policy advisor. He's the author of Containing Big Tech, subtitled How to Protect Our Civil Rights, Economy, and Democracy. He is founder and CEO of Centrify, a leading cybersecurity cloud provider with over 2,000 enterprise customers, including over 60% of the Fortune 50. He's a Silicon Valley angel investor with seen investments in over a dozen tech startups, and he served as a technology policy advisor and led marketing efforts to pass the California Privacy Rights Act in 2020, as well as advising and contributing to state privacy bills in 2023, including the California Delete Act and a Texas Data Broker Requirement Act. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science and History from the University of Michigan. In this conversation, Tom and I cover the impact and influence of big tech, data collection and surveillance, and some simple steps you can take to safeguard your privacy. Let's dive in and get ready for the future. Tom, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to dive in today. So how did you end up in Silicon Valley? I grew up in Michigan and uh, I actually, one summer, I worked as an IT person, as an intern, and I worked on this technology called Oracle um, and uh while at Michigan, Oracle came to campus and I interviewed and they said, okay, we're very interested. And they sent me out to California. And I was just amazed how beautiful California was because Michigan is very flat. And up here in Northern California, there's rolling hills and the weather is nice. And I was like, man, this is the, uh, the world of uh, fruit and honey and high tech and all that stuff. And so that's how I ended up in Silicon Valley. I, I, I always thought I would probably end up in a place like Chicago, but uh, Silicon Valley uh, just grabbed me. But you had already been studying computer science. Yeah, I was a computer science major, but I also was a history major uh, and, and probably more so of a history major than a computer science major. Uh, and I think it's it's good to kind of have a good balance of both liberal arts and, and, and tech uh, because it uh, definitely allows you to maybe put yourself in the seat of users of technology and, and think more about the impact of the technology on people and how they interact with it. Yeah, I, I'm finding that in all of my interactions with people in tech, founders and investors and um engineers, it's the people who get philosophy or history or the humanities who really are really, really um, add real value to the world. Whereas people who are just straight tech, maybe not so much. Yeah, I think it's really, it's really going back to the Steve Jobs quote from many years ago, which is you just can't build technology for the sake of building technology. You really got to start from the end user perspective and then kind of build the technology that, that meets the, the needs uh, right there. And so I think it's really just, you know, focusing on the consumer, focusing on the user uh, for, for the experience. And I think that's what I've tried to do in my tech career. So you ended up in Silicon Valley because you thought California is really nice. Um, and you were in tech, so that's it makes total sense. Okay, tell us about Centrify. Like, what did you do at Centrify? And you're it's a cybersecurity company. Like, what and you founded it? So that's a big deal to be a founder. You have to be really smart and super dedicated and really care about something. Yeah. So before Centrify, I, I 
helped to start another tech company, and that was successful. It actually went public. Uh, but one thing I wanted to do was actually be the CEO myself. And so that was kind of a career goal that I always wanted to lead a company. And so uh, after uh, the prior company went public and I was there for a total of eight years, I, I left. And so part of the challenge was I wanted to like start something from scratch. The, the other thing was, was that I definitely saw a, at the time, a significant need to protect and secure data and users. And I felt, and this is, oh geez, this is like 20 years ago, that cybersecurity would be a big thing. Um, and I started looking at where there are some white spaces, what needs to be done. And so, yeah, so form Centrify. But the, but the key thing is whenever you form a company is you need great teammates. It's it's not a one-person operation. You need a great team of, of people to complement you. So I was very fortunate to bring on a couple co-founders that complemented what I did. And so we built a cybersecurity company and eventually uh, over 10 years grew it to over $100 million plus in, in revenue, over 2,000 customers, including half the Fortune 50, raised $90 million in venture capital, and then eventually it got, got acquired. Uh, in, instead of going public like my, my prior company that I co-founded, this one was acquired by a private equity firm. Hmm. Okay. What is an angel investor? Angel investor uh, typically is an individual uh, that has previously uh, been an entrepreneur, uh, has you know made some money through their blood, sweat, and tears, um, and wants to invest in kind of the next generation of entrepreneurs. And so typically when an entrepreneur at the very early stage, which off at the seed stage, as in planting a seed, uh, you know, they're looking for some money to kind of jumpstart, flesh out the idea, bring on the initial uh, team, and get to the point where they may have some form of a minimal viable product, and to the get to the point where they can then go out and look for institutional funding uh, as well. So typically, um, people look for angel rounds or seed rounds. It's measured in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, through my network here and people reaching out to me, I've actually invested in uh, over 15 companies. And so my check sizes are in the tens of thousands. Um, and uh, I band together with other individuals to, you know, kickstart um, entrepreneurs in their in their journey. And hopefully they get to the point where they, they have enough momentum and, a, and some form of a product that they can go out there and raise uh, a venture round of some sort from, uh, from an in institution where they maybe raise a million or $2 million after getting the initial uh, million from angels. Yeah. I just think, I think it's so important. A lot of people don't understand how Silicon Valley works or how money venture capital works or how angel investing works. And I think a lot, there are a lot of great ideas out there that are not being funded because the people who have those ideas don't even know how to go about making them, you know, a reality. And so I, that's why I wanted to sort of have you explain that bit. Okay. So, but you're generally a bit of an angel. You're a good guy trying to help people get jumpstart their ideas. And get like good product so. in the world. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I mean, it's um, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there um, that uh, you know may not know the investment community, um, but at the end of the day, what they need to show and prove is that they've got a good idea and they can get some form of a product out the door. Um, and so, yeah, just like uh, they may contact their uncle Larry, who is a dentist, that may give them a hundred thousand dollars or whatever. Uh, you know, it's kind of a similar thing that uh, angels band together, and uh, you know, they're doing it to invest in the next set of entrepreneurs. Obviously, at the same time, you want to make some money off this as well. Um, you know, this is not a charity; um, this is capitalism here as well. So, yeah, it's just that is kind of what happens here in Silicon Valley. And there's, uh, th there are, you know, hundreds of angel investors uh, like myself that are just individuals that, that, that invest in, in companies. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So a day in the life of Tom Kemp, before we dive into the book and all the big, really nitty gritty of these issues that we're going to talk about. Yeah. So, um, 
I'm doing a couple different things. Uh, so I've been heavily involved in public policy. And as you mentioned in my introduction, um, I worked it, here in California on Prop 24, the California Privacy Rights Act. So I was a full-time volunteer. With, and that was actually a political campaign. Uh, and then over the last uh, two years, I've been contributing to legislation, proposing it to, to politicians. So did a bill in Texas, and then most recently, this California Delete Act. And so it's really interesting, given that I, I wrote this book containing big tech, talked a lot about AI, and had success with the California Privacy Rights Act, the California Delete Act. So politicians and groups are actually coming to me and say, hey, can you help us with some ideas about future legislation. And so right now I'm, I'm working with different groups and politicians and ideas for 2024. A uh, lot of interest in, in putting guardrails around AI, for example. Um, and then the, the other thing is, is that I, I, I want to evangelize on the issues associated with uh, big tech and some of the concerns I have. So I'm finishing up my book tour and doing podcasts like this. Um, also thinking in the back of my mind, maybe writing another book. And then I also spend time with entrepreneurs, um, like we talked about with the angel investing, mentoring kind of the next generation of CEOs um, and trying to help them in their journey and, and talking about, you know, hey, is your product a must have versus nice have product, uh, you know, helping them uh, talk about what they should do to build the team and get to that minimal viable product that represents uh, a, a painkiller versus a, an aspirin in, in whatever markets they pick. Okay. And what about you get up at six o'clock and then you drink a cup of coffee, you go for a run? I wake up. Um, I, I have a couple of kids. Two of them uh, have, uh, one's in college, one's graduated, but I, I have a high schooler. So I help get that kid uh, out the door. Um, and then um, I have a set of meetings. And uh, But I also like to carve out time just to think. So I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm in a fortunate situation that um, I, I worked my ass off with these different companies that I talked about before, building them and, and getting them to a certain size and scope. And so right now I'm kind of at a stage in my career where I'm just trying to see how I can add value. Potentially, you know, maybe next year or the year after that, you know, maybe start a new company and start and do the entrepreneurial thing myself. So it's really about just meeting with people, but but I'm at a stage right now where I just try to sit down with a book or read articles or write um, and just try to sort out, you know, is there stuff that I can do as it relates to policy? Um, is there things I can talk with entrepreneurs about, um, et cetera? So it's just, it's like meeting, half meetings, half writing. And then of course, always dealing with uh, uh, in a good way with, with my wife, my, my child that still lives here and my kids that are one's in college and one's uh, graduated. So Okay. So he's a normal guy, folks. I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you wrote this book. We have this massively oh. toxic relationship with big tech, like all of us. We're all being abused and we're not leaving. We can't leave. And this book con containing big tech, how to protect our civil rights, economy, and democracy really helps normal people, regular people, non-techies to sort of get clarity on what's going on and maybe get really specific steps they can take to change this toxic relationship. Okay, so why did you write the book? I mean, you could have written a number of tech books, right? You've had all this experience. You could probably talked about how to start up a startup, how to start a startup, how to be a founder, how to do, how to build a minimum viable product how to hire great people. I mean, the many, many different areas you could have gone in. You tell me, why write this book? There, there needed to be a, a book in this area. Now, there had been books in the past, uh, like five, six years ago, there was Shoshana Zuboff's The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Roger McNamee wrote the book Zucked. Those are like four or five years ago. They don't take it into account the rise of AI, the rise of TikTok, but also even more significantly, the Dobbs decision, where things that were legal before that, and rights that we had are now illegal in some states. And that means that there is now a greater opportunity to weaponize data against people. Um, and a lot of the guardrails that some of the tech companies 
put in place after the 2016 election in terms of disinformation, um, et cetera, are now going away. Um, and so I kind of looked at what's needed. And I think part of it is, is that uh, there needs to be more education about the, the challenges associated with big tech, but also what to do. I just didn't want to be like a Debbie Downer and say, oh, you know, the world sucks. So these companies are blah, 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 blah. I actually said, hey, here's some solutions that you can take as individuals, but also what, um, you know, what we can do from a policy perspective. And I didn't want to provide an academic book. Um, because most of the books have been yeah. very academic oriented. I wanted something, again, using that Uncle Larry analogy, something that you could hand a person that cares about different you know, issues, like they may yeah. care about climate change or they do care about technology, but they don't really understand like what are the core business models? How is this data being used? They may not understand exactly what AI is, which is much more than just gen AI. Yeah. And they also don't understand the fact that these companies have become large monopolies or duopolies um, and they have such reach and they're in such control that it actually exasperates the problems that we have with privacy and cybersecurity uh, because they're not being pushed from a competitive perspective to differentiate in those areas. Yeah, and we're going to go into all of that because I think that's such a big point here. Okay, which are the big tech companies? And let's talk about how they're, all the terrible things they're doing. Yeah, so um, for me, the big five tech uh, big tech companies are Meta, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And you um, mentioned and that I, ByteDance, TikTok's parent company might be joining that. Exactly. But I, I look at them uh, in terms of uh, the way that I judge that, you know, who's in the big tech crowd is the number of users they have. Um, and TikTok is getting very close. I kind of drew the line at 2 billion uh, users and also just the revenue associated with them, and then their market presence uh, as well. TikTok will probably in the next year or two be part of the big tech um, community or crowd. And so, um, talk about talk about the scope of these companies in terms of like users around the world and um, how many impact they actually have globally. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, so Meta, I think in their latest earnings announcement, are at like 3 billion uh, monthly uh, users. Um, and there's only 8 billion people in the world. Uh, Google is at uh, 4 uh, billion. Um, Apple um, is uh, approaching the 2 billion mark. Uh, Microsoft with Windows and different devices is is close to that um, uh, mark as well. TikTok's over a billion. Um, and so they'll, they'll be getting close to 2 billion uh, as well. I mean, but the thing is, is that I, I, one thing I want to point out is, is that we've had large monopolies in the past, like yeah. Standard Oil, General Mo Motors, um, and, but it took General Motors a hundred years to get to a billion cars. I mean, you know, TikTok got to a billion users in, you know, like, seven, eight years and yeah. same meta took 12 years. Um, and then the other big difference, of course, compared to past monopolies is that yes, standard oil was huge, but they didn't know everything about us. And that, that's fundamentally different is that the amount of information and data that's being collected about us is unheard of uh, compared to, and, and the insight they have into consumers is completely unheard of compared to the railroads that we had in California, the Standard Oil, AT&T, um, et cetera. Okay, so look, we, we do have this antipathy towards big, these big conglomerates, right? Big pharma, big oil, big auto, you know, AT&T back in the day. We we have this sort of feeling like, oh, these are bad. But you say very clearly, and you go in depth in the book about why it's big tech is so much worse. So conglomerates and monopolistic behavior is bad, right, in general. And then with big tech, it's a whole other level. Can you drill down on that a little bit? Yeah, so I think in these companies um, are in some of the most significant digital markets um, and 
a lot of commerce flows through them. So they're kind of the gatekeeper, the choke point. Um, and as the economy evolves into one that increasingly uses AI, AI is powered by compute power and data, and they actually control both as well. So mm -hmm. they also are in the driver's seat um, as it relates to the next kind of wave of technology that's happening. And the problem is, is that when you have companies that eventually get too big to fail, they also get too big to care. Um, and what happens is, is that um, it, it's diff that that things start happening as it relates to our civil rights, as it relates to, in this particular case, the, the collection of our information, but it also stifles innovation. And let me give some concrete examples. Like you look at Amazon with e-commerce or, or Apple or Google with their mobile operating systems, um, they, they own the marketplaces, but they also compete in the marketplaces. So if you're a mobile app provider that charges for eBooks, for example, you have to pay Google or Apple 30% if the consumer buys from the mobile app. But if Google or Apple offers that ebook, they don't have to pay that platform tax. Similarly, you know, everything throws through Amazon's marketplace and they can see what products are selling and then they can come out with their own knockoffs, um, but they don't have to pay the same price or tax to, to Amazon because they are Amazon as well. And so what happens is, is that you see significant impact to small and medium businesses, other technology providers. We've seen this with the news uh, and journalism uh, that the information flows through the large tech platforms and this defunds journalism that has a significant impact on our democracy. So it, it's not a just about the you know commerce and specific markets. It has ripple effects to uh, things that impact our democracy, such as journalism, uh, et cetera. So, and when you have these companies just being so so big, um, some of the issues that are associated with them, such as privacy and cybersecurity, get exasperated because they're not being pushed to be more uh, friendly to consumers in this area as well. I mean, you know, Meta has been ha was ha hacked five different times in 2019. I mean, the data was stolen. Plus, there was issues coming out of Cambridge Analytica that they were justifiably flagged for. But there isn't an alternative to what they offer. So they don't have to fundamentally change their practices. And recently we've been seeing these various whistleblowers as it relates to Instagram and kids. This is, I mean, it was first Francis Haugen and now it was this, this recent guy. They haven't changed. I mean, people have been talking about the bad stuff that's been happening on Instagram for years, but it just keeps on repeating itself as well. And that's and, because there is not there's no competition. So people can't leave and go somewhere else. Basically, yeah. what does it come yeah. down to? So, so what they've done is they've built walled gardens and inside the walled gardens, they mine your data and they serve you ads, right? And if you want to leave the walled gardens and, and like, okay, I want to get off of Facebook, unless all your friends move en masse to a new service, et cetera, you're kind of, you're kind of stuck. And, they're, and people are stuck because of the whole network effects that, that have occurred. And so one way to potentially address these issues uh, is, you know, require and mandate interoperability. Um, and so, I mean, the ironic thing is Facebook started by scraping data from MySpace and providing a level of interoperability via scraping. But if you try to do something similar to Facebook today, if you're trying to build a competitor to Facebook, they'll sue you into oblivion, right? Uh, because they don't want the interoperability uh, to occur. And we see that happening with Twitter, now X with Elon Musk, that he's trying to make it, he's trying to decrease the amount of interoperability to keep it, keep the, the walls of the garden up there as well. But, you know, the, the funny thing is, is that actually, if you're able to address these issues with respect to monopoly, great things happen. Like AT&T, when AT&T was broken up, the te telecommunications revol revolution began. When Microsoft, I don't know, if maybe some of your listeners may not recall, that Microsoft mandated Internet Explorer to be the browser. They killed Netscape 
browser overnight yeah. Yeah. because all all the OEMs all they could do is put uh, Internet Explorer. But then when the DOJ, which was the last major antitrust lawsuit in tech, went after them and they they un they unbundled Internet Explorer, it opened up an internet revolution and companies like Google with Chrome was able to take advantage of the fact that uh, the world you know, did not, you know, Microsoft be, be, did not mandate Internet Explorer everywhere as well. So ironically, good things happen when you actually require interoperability or break up some of these large conglomerates in, in technology. And, and we, we have, we've seen that with the internet revolution and telecommunications revolution. It occurred in part because of the strong antitrust activity that, that, that happened at the time. So why, I want to get into all the details about digital surveillance and data brokers and all of how that works for our listeners. But why is it, why have we allowed it to get this far? Why has nothing really happened? I know that recently there is some, um, there is a case happening uh, with an antitrust case happening, the first significant one for like decades. Well, why have we let well, it get out of hand? Why have we not, why has the government not come in and done something? There's two reasons. Uh, the first of which is is that the data collection practices have historically been unregulated. And I think people still have that perception of Meta and Google and, and some of the other tech companies as, you know, two guys and a dog in a garage. And, and, and yeah, there was amazing things that happened. These companies were able to go public and, 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 and driving kind of a lot of the innovation in the economy. But eventually they got, they got to a size and the, over time, their business models evolved to significant collection of information. And we've been fundamentally unable to put forth a privacy law at a national level to protect people. So the first way that they got really big was that there has been no regulation of data collection, and we do not have a federal pri privacy law. The second reason is to your to your point, which is as it relates to antitrust, that uh, Robert Bork and, and and Reagan they they came up with an interesting philosophy about uh, antitrust, which is if if prices to consumers don't go up, then then these companies are not technically monopolies; they can't be broken up, etc. But they didn't take into account kind of uh, the Bork or the Chicago School of uh, of antitrust. They didn't take into account that you need to look at things other than just prices to consumers. You need to look at impact on uh, competition and downstream uh, impact on. Uh, people that provide goods as part of these marketplaces, the hit on, on businesses that try to compete in the marketplace. And you have someone like Amazon coming out with basics and kind of crushing them as well. And so now with the Biden administration putting Lena Khan and uh, into FTC, Jonathan Cantor, we now are starting to see some lawsuits like the Google one regarding the browser. And then there's a bunch of others in the pipeline as well. And then there've been individual uh, companies such as Epic suing Google about the practices, about the 30% transaction fees uh, on their platforms. And so there is activity, but it's the it's the change in antitrust and the the lack of privacy laws uh, have caused these companies to become, you know, kind of too big to care. In, a, in America, we pride ourselves on being all about capitalism, but this is bad capitalism. There's good, there's capitalism and there's good capitalism. And this is just straight up bad capitalism. If you're not, co competition is a core component of capitalism. We, we people, we, we have to have an environment where there's a, people can enter the market, people can participate freely, people can compete, it's supposed to be a free market, like all of the tenets of capitalism are like completely deleted in this whole, in this complete mess that we have. What do you say to that? Yeah, actually, the the cover uh, of big tech being kind of a cloud-based octopus kind of parallels the past images of the railroad, standard oil, uh, et cetera. So this is stuff that we've been dealing with um, for forever. Eventually, it gets to a point where there are the, the companies, it, it becomes not healthy. Um, and this also uh, kind of is an ode to kind of the battles about consumer protection um, that, uh, you know, California has really led the way, uh, you know, not only in 
when it comes to consumer protection, but auto emissions, et cetera, that things have taken hold at the state level. Look, I, I want to be very clear. One thing that I don't propose in the book is I'm going to call it airline type safety, where you have to do a thousand checks before you know a plane takes off and you want to avoid every crash you know possible. I think what I'm thinking is what we really need is more car safety as it relates to the regulation to be put on the um, tech companies. So much like we made the decision as a society to not have you know babies just be in someone's lap in the in the front seat to actually have a you know baby carrier uh, in the back that we've agreed to put airbags in the cars we have speed limits we set emission standards and look i mean the automobile industry is one of the more innovative ones uh, right now and has a lot of good competition especially if you look at electric cars uh, etc um and so you know this is stuff that we've been dealing with and actually you know it was interesting that um um, you know, this is, these are the, the type of things that we've been talking about, uh, you know, for a hundred years. And I'm going to quote um, uh, Senator John Sherman in 1890. If we will not endure a king as a political power, we should not endure a king over the production, transportation, and sale of the necessaries of life. And so really this was you know, talking about the railroads, talking about standard oil with the Sherman antitrust thing and this is the same battle do do is it is it appropriate for us to have four or five people acting kings uh, of the whole economy and, and technology and I, I just think that having such concentration of power uh, is not healthy I'm going to quote one more person um, which is justice Brandeis uh, we must make our choice we may have democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few but we cannot have both and so I think this has just been the classic American issue that we've been dealing with for 150 years yeah and you're not saying you're not suggesting that the legislation or regulation you want legislation or regulation that's pro innovation that supports good technology and good business not and i know i think some people may take it a little bit further than that and really want government to clamp down on technologists and and there's that whole other sort of conversation that sort of plays is playing out where there are the people who want, they want regulation, heavy regulation on artificial intelligence and other people, the technologists sort of pushing back and saying, if you do that, all you're going to do is allow the big tech companies to control everything. So anyway, that's a whole other conversation. I'm going to just say, yeah, look, I'm a, I'm a capitalist. I, I believe yeah. in innovation, but I, like, and, and people push back at me, like even like venture capitalists or, or, or people and, or apologists for big tech. I said, okay, wait a minute. If you go and buy something at a store, what do you pay visa in terms of a, tr what does the merchant pay visa? Like one or 2%. Well, yeah. do you know that Google or Apple to do a transaction charges 30%? That's yeah. just not fair, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and you can kind of go down the whole list that the fact that they own the marketplace, but they compete in the marketplace. That's insane. That that's why Epic is suing Google because you know they're trying to sell games. Um, and if you buy the game on the Epic website, you don't have to pay the thirty percent. But if you buy it through Google, you have to pay the thirty percent. And that's money, especially if you buy a subscription to the New York Times. 30% comes out of the money that could fund journalism as well. And so I think there just needs to be uh, a look at the fact that these companies are both in, in markets, they're both the pitcher, the catcher, and the umpire, and that's just not healthy. Yeah, and if we had options, then it's fine, but we don't have options. That's that, one of the big problems. Okay, yep. in, you, in the book, you go through chapter by chapter and really sort of lay out the key things that we as users and, and lay people need to understand. And, and you talk about digital surveillance. Give us a quick overview. What's really going on with digital surveillance? For the person who is sort of busy running about doing their life and not really aware of what's actually happening every time they log on to, to, to their computer laptop or they use their you know, smartphone and have their location device on. Um, their lo yeah, what what's going on with yeah, digital I mean, surveillance? Yeah, so the majority of the big tech companies, um, you know, surveil us um, and and they mine our personal data and for the goal of serving ads. And obviously, uh, in the case of Meta, ninety seven percent of their revenue comes from advertising. Google, it's eighty percent. 
Amazon, it's increasingly advertising. Microsoft has a large advertising business. Apple less so, um, or, or actually hardly any uh, right there. So Apple gets a pass when it comes to digital surveillance. And in, in the early days of big tech, the mining of data was about serving us ads. And we said, okay, we will make this trade off of giving our data and dealing with red ads. So that's you know, when we were shopping for, say, red shoes, the red shoes followed us around the internet and all our devices for the next month trying to get us to do that. But but the issue is, is that increasingly people are figuring out ways to weaponize this data. And we're now in a post-abortion rights America where health data can actually be used against people. And then um, you also, and, and that pe- then people will even push back against that. And I, and I give some real world examples of that you can use Google and Meta's advertising system to target, say, young women with uh, babies to sell them diapers. But it was found that people were using that same targeted advertising system to exclude people from seeing job posts, rentals, et cetera. So you could use that information to say, I don't want for my rental property to have it be advertised to young single women with with babies, right? And so that's kind of what we're at right now with this data. And of course, um, you know, when it comes to abortion related searches and and, and activity that that uh, prosecutors in certain states could could use that to uh, go after people that uh, seeked reproductive health care. But the issue is going to get now even going to get worse with AI because AI will take that personal information um, and potentially use it to either further personalize feeds of inf- uh, uh, videos or movies or postings, et cetera, to make their product more addictive so we spend more time on it. Um, and that eventually leads us into rabbit holes of conspiracy theories. And that that has led to uh, a lot of the polarization that we have in our democracy. So it's not healthy. Um, or they will use personalization to sell us more, more ads. And much like... Um, musicians and writers are very concerned about their copyright material being used by AI systems, we in effect kind of have our own copyright material, which is our face or voice, et cetera. I don't think we want that to be fed into AI as well. So that's the fundamental issue uh, that we face with digital surveillance, that we sh- we don't know what's being collected. We don't have the right to say no. And oftentimes that data is being shared or even sold by by data brokers. Somehow we've all come to believe that this is normal. We've bought into it and we've been groomed into it, like groomed into this terrible relationship where we are actively in giving up our rights. For the last two decades, it's, it's, this, this thing has been happening and it's been growing and it, it's expanding and we seem to think it's okay. And like most people think it's, they don't even, they're not even aware. Why are we not more educated about this? It's been kind of like the the frog in the the hot the water that's increasingly get hot. I mean, so originally it was like, okay, fine, you know, I'll see these red ads. I mean, red shoe ads follow me around. That's that's a little creepy, but no big deal. But um, but then the tech firms um, and the data brokers said, you know what, we could even do more targeting. Um, and so let's actually collect more information because the thought process is the more data that's collected, there's the the the, the, the ability to actually target. And so now what's happening is like there's no regulation about the collection of health information, for example. Clearly, there is regulation if you're a covered entity under HIPAA, like a, a hospital or your doctor, but for health care related devices, like something that you put on your wrist or your, your finger, et cetera, uh, or apps that, you know, track uh, your period or or your heartbeat or or diabetes or whatever they don't have they're not covered under HIPAA and so part of their monetization strategy is to sell that and so people want that data about our 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 health um, and other sensitive information as well so it's been a gradual 
increasingly uh, collection of information and people may say, well, I don't have anything to hide, right? I mean, so, you know, so the question is, does what, you know, people may say, well, okay, fine. I, I get that it's bad that they're collecting more information, but I have nothing to hide. And the, the issue, of course, is, is that, well, would you, if people were doing this for kids, like in the physical world, videotaping and collecting everything, what a kid was doing, you, they would be a stalker and you would call the police. And so it's not healthy, for example, to have this behavioral uh, data collection happen, happening for, for kids uh, because they're going to, because kids are very impressionable. And it, it really doesn't allow us to kind of explore and find ourselves if we know that we're constantly being surveilled. And of course, people have found ways to do bad things. Their identity theft uh, it is based on a lot of this personal data that's floating out about us on the internet, um, so they can send us uh, spear phishing. Um, and then, you know, is it healthy in a society for businesses to know more personally about us? That if I'm gay or if I have ca cancer, then my family or friends? No, I don't think so. I talked about that example of how it can be used to discriminate, and of course, it can be used to manipulate people by playing upon our fears by political actors or foreign states um, and kind of push us and, and polarize us as well. So it, it, it's, it, it's slowly over time, it's just gotten worse and worse. Um, and now we're seeing like the, the end results of that in our society. What, what is the solution? The solution is a uh, couple fold. So the, f the first solution is to educate people um, and know that their data is being constantly collected and then tell people how they can reduce their data footprint. The second solution is to actually put in place uh, privacy laws and regulations that have teeth um, that are not written by the actual lob industry lobbyist um, and have a strong national privacy law that's consumer centric. What actually happened is California was the first to come out with a privacy law in the United States. And then the large tech companies said, uh oh. And so when people started proposing them in other states, it turned out the industry lobbyists started writing the laws. And so like the, one of the next states was Virginia. That was purely written by the industry, um, that the Virginia privacy law. Yeah, do you have some rights, you know, right to know what's being collected, right to delete, um, but they make it very difficult to actually take advantage of those rights as well. And so they put a little speed bumps right there. So we do need both education of telling people about the problems, we need, um, but we also need policy and guardrails, not only as it relates to data collection, but but we need to introduce more competition from an antitrust perspective to force the companies to actually be able to compete on features that are consumer uh, protection centric. I find it baffling, really. I feel like we're all locked into this whole sort of dystopian sort of the reality, and we're not even aware that this is happening. We are most people are not aware that they're losing their privacy and they're losing their rights. Can you explain to listeners like why their privacy matters? Like why they should be concerned about their relationship with with technology and how it's eroding their they have we have no privacy. We literally have no privacy. Everything we input on the on our devices is seen, collected and um, information is created out of it, and then it's monetized in multiple ways. And yep. we have, we're like little stupid pawns in this weird, creepy hunger games of, of technology. Like, that's what's really happening. We're still buying into the appearance of it on the front end, but the reality in, on the back end, what's actually happening is a whole different story. You've studied this. Why does privacy matter? Why does your privacy, an individual's privacy matter? And what, what, every time they use their smartphone or just not even use their smartphone, carry it around, what actually is happening and why is it eroding their rights? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, let's define privacy. And I'm going to go back to, I quoted Justice uh, Lewis Brandeis before. He defined privacy as the right to be let alone. And at the fundamental, why do we need privacy? 
um, we need the ability to explore and find ourselves um, without it being recorded and it being sold. I mean, we unfortunately were kind of uh, in that Big Brother TV show where everything's being recorded, right? Uh, but in this case, it's it's uh, stuff that we're doing. It's the digital exhaust that we're giving out. So I think it's really we need we need the space that you know, especially when we're kids, like we don't know who we are. We don't know you know what our sexuality is. We don't know what our political affiliations are. We don't know who our friends are and what's important to us. And and in the old days, we did that exploration by talking to people, to, by reading books, physical books, etc. But nowadays, you know, people, you know, will go and Google, "Am I gay?" Right? Or you know, they'll join chat groups or news groups or, or whatnot to learn more about different things and and things that they may have like uh, you know a lot of people you know, have changed their politics just like they changed their hairstyles, right? But, but, and that's fine because I, I don't want anyone bringing up a picture of how I looked in the 80s with my hairstyle, right? Uh, you know, and be used against me. But the, the problem that we have is that all this information is being collected and they kind of know the, this journey that you're taking and they don't have your best interest in mind. They, they want to use that data to sell you stuff. And in the past, it was historically selling you goods, but now they want to sell ideology or push you in certain directions from a political perspective. And that's why we we see that there's been manipulation. And that's why we've gotten to the point where we you know, have so many people subscribing to conspiracy theories because they, they take some of the personal information, they feed into the blender, and then things get... Uh, algorithmically amplified um and so then we kind of fall into the to these ruts etc so it, it's critical that people understand what's happening right um that it's okay to be upset about uh like god i can't believe they're doing this but as long as you know they're doing and you're conscious about that um i think that's the first step that like yeah. that you realize the the, the reason why you're seeing this ad is based on stuff that you've done previously online. Now, the, the, the negative things about the phone is that the apps, some of the apps that are free, the way that they actually monetize is that they've uh, embedded third-party SDKs and they'll collect your location information. And the more apps that have, uh, that, that are installed on your phone that are collecting you know, location data about you, then that information gets aggregated and they can actually track exactly where you're going. Is there, some people may use it to determine, uh, for example, what stores are getting the most traffic. And so if a new um, uh, store wants to open, they may want to see the actual mobile device foot traffic that occurs. And yeah, I can see that there's value right there to making sure that they're setting up a store in the right place where there's a lot of foot traffic. But the problem is, is that, you know, we've seen instances in which location data has been sold back to the government to track the location of people. Um, and basically, they're getting around the Fourth Amendment. So instead of getting a, a court order slash subpoena to go to a telco provider to get someone's location, you, you see police departments or the government just buying the data directly from uh, data brokers, and then they can track you know, where people are going, um, et cetera. So I think the fundamental issue is, is that it's just not healthy for us to have everything that we're doing being tracked. And as I said before, you know, standard oil in the past was powerful, but they didn't know everything about us. And so we need policy, but we need awareness. Um, and uh, and th there are things that we can do. And I talk about in the book as consumers that we can do to reduce our data footprint, to make this problem worse. And, and I actually uh, have an appendix at the back that kind of walks people through exactly what you can do to dramatically reduce the amount of data being collected about you. I, you know, the problem is people are busy and they're running about their lives and they're like, oh, whatever. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm being tracked. Oh, I know. I know. I mm -hmm. know they're collecting. They're surveilling me. Oh, my gosh. But they're not. Nothing nothing changes. So we re we need a real awakening. It's like a shift in consciousness. We have to snap out of it. We're like asleep, you know. We're in sort of this tech techno-somnambulist state where we're sleepwalking 
in technology and we're like lost sight of who we really are as human beings and our consciousness and our sense of self. We need to change. I think it's going to get, I mean, unfortunately with AI, where we're not going to know if it's real or if it's synthetic, is it human or is it computer generated? Um, and so I think that there's going to be a, just like that there was a big movement for organic food to go after versus the, the synthetic uh, stuff um, uh, that I think that there is going to be a move afoot to have more or have an organic internet, right? Where it it does uh, not require uh, the mass amount of collection of information. So I think people are heading in that direction. Uh, But one thing I do talk about in the book is I understand that uh, I I actually say, here are some things you can do within a minute or two to actually make the situation better. And at the same time in the book, I define exactly what we should do in terms of some legislation, like here are the 10 things you need um, that can make a dramatic uh, impact as well. So as I said before, I just don't want to be a complete Debbie Downer. There, There are things, there are solutions, and there are things that we can do that can both improve things from a personal perspective as well as from a societal perspective. And I think that we need it. It's an infrastructure, at a tech infrastructure level, we need to get away from client server architecture and we need something new. But that's another conversation. Tom, if we don't contain big tech, what does the future look like? I, I think it's going to go to uh, a kind of a complete blurring of uh, people understanding human versus synthetic in terms of, you know, the gen AI revolution. I mean, the gen AI, I mean, again, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, like just AI, like the amazing things that are being done in in medicine um, and, you know, sensors to improve car safety, things of that nature as well. But we, but the, the negative side is, is that we don't know if content that we're reading has actually been created by humans or if it was generated and it's trying to put, you know, everything becomes SEO optimized, right? And so, so it, it, it dumbs down, um, you know, knowledge, right? Um, and so that's, that's a huge concern. Um, I, I'm also hugely concerned that, you know, will Gen AI kind of find, you know, will, will completely kill off news and journalism. I mean, it's already, you know, journalism's already, you know, maybe at 20% of what it was, you know, 30 years ago, will it drop it to 5%, et cetera, because everything will be generated by AI. But and then course, the source, yeah. and then based on what sources would AI well, generate it, the information? They'll, people will put their thumb on the scale what the sources are, right? And then all of a sudden, the, the, the AI will then start generating things from a certain bias. The data will be biased uh, that will be fed into it as, as well. So, yeah, I mean, look, so that's that's the negative, right? That That's, the, that's kind of the worst world situation where the problems that we have become further exasperated. On the positive side, um, you know, what what could happen um, is that that people finally get control and rights. They have a big, easy button to say no to the collection of my information and please delete it. And, and in part, that's what I did with this bill in California, the California Delete Act, that would give consumers the ability to, and it's not going to kick into 2026, but a portal where you can simply go in and say, I want these third parties to delete the data that they've collected on me and no longer collect it moving forward and no longer sell and share it. And you just go there and you just, boom, put your email address in. It's kind of like the FDC do not call registry. And hundreds of data brokers then have to go and delete all your data. I mean, and it takes you 30 seconds to do that. And there's other suggestions that I have that literally we could set up things um, like, for example, put a signal um, on your your mobile device or your browser that has you opt out of the selling and collection of your information. We have that technology. It's called global privacy control. Um, we can put that in legislation that businesses have to respect that. And then every time you visit a new website or go to a new, uh, use a new mobile app, et cetera, they have to respect that. Um, so there are simple things we can do to give people control over 
how their data is being used um, and and minimize its uh, usage when they do in fact collect it for the purposes spelled out, as opposed to, yes, I'm using Uber to pick me up. I'm giving my location, but I don't. I only want my location to be used for. for for to pick me up and get me from point A to point B. I don't want my location be used to figure out that you're picking me up at a cancer clinic or an alcoholics anonymous uh, location, et cetera. I mean, so those are the things that that we can do to limit that type of stuff from potentially happening. Yeah. I think more people that are awake and aware and conscious of what's happening, the quicker you'll see some shift. At, at personal levels, but also at a legislative level, and we need all of it. In every episode, I'm giving our listeners one thing to do that will change their life. What can people do? Like one simple thing that they can do that will get them ready for the world as it is and the future. Okay. Well, on a, on a global level, uh, tell the people that you love just randomly tell them that you love them and you appreciate them, et cetera. Um, but uh, from a technical perspective, um, you can reduce your footprint today. And so here's quickly, just literally, this will take a couple minutes just to do this. Yeah. Like um, on, on Apple, there's this thing called app tracking transparency that blocks third-party trackers. Just turn that on and that will like, dramatically reduce the amount of data going to these data brokers. If you're on an Android device, download DuckDuckGo. It's a, it's a browser um, and a search engine, but if you just simply have the app, it'll do the same thing. If you um, have a Windows uh, system, you can download this uh, uh, third-party tracker and you can use a free one from uh, EFF. It's called Privacy Badger. I mean, so just Turning on uh, app tracking transparency on, on iOS or DuckDuckGo on Android, downloading, installing it, using Privacy Badger as a plugin into your browser, it reduces like 90, 95% of the data that's being collected on you. And then for the big tech companies that you can go to, go to myactivity.google.com. Obviously, you have to be logged into your Google account. So it's myactivity.google.com. And then turn off personalization. And that stops all that the data collection. So what I spent talking to you in the last minute and a half, just doing these three or four things will reduce about 97% of the data that's being collected about you. I'm not, there's still being data collected about you on your, you know, in your car or, or some other stuff, but this, this, this deals with your, your PC or your Mac or your phone. And, and that's huge. Okay. So we all, I'll put the links to all of, to those, all the things you mentioned. Cool in the description so people can just readily go there and make these improvements. What else? What else? Uh, in your researching the book, Tom, before I let you go, yeah. what else? What did you learn that surprised you? I learned that, um, that the tech companies will say one thing, but, but, but act another way. The best example is after the Roe v. Wade uh, was overturned with the Dobbs decision, you know, there was reports that Google employees got together and and basically told, you know, kind of protested internally and and, and pressured the Google management that they would no longer collect any abortion related searches or if you visited abortion clinic, the, the geolocation information, et cetera. And Google came out with a, a nice blog post and they patted themselves on the back. Well, that was in the June, July of last year perspective. So in August, September, I said, okay, let's actually test that out. And um, I, I did a bunch of tests, and including uh, uh, driving to a Planned Parenthood, uh, putting things in my searches, my, my calendar system, downloading specific apps. And it turned out they weren't doing that. And in November, uh, my research was featured in an article in The Guardian. Uh, this, this research is also in the book. Uh, and then you think something would happen, but, uh, but then five months later, Jeffrey Fowler at the Washington post came out with a similar article that saying Google was still collecting your abortion related searches and location information. And that caused, uh, 10 senators to write a letter to Google saying WTF right there. So, um, you know, for all the talk of, you know, do no evil. And we, of course we care about consumers and all that stuff. Um, it's just the level of what they'll say at the, 
you know, at the congressional hearing or in a blog post, uh, you know, it's not necessarily true in terms of if they implemented it or how they implemented it as well. So that was kind of the big surprise that it was kind of the blatantness of them, you know, saying that they were doing one thing uh, to make the matters better, but in the end, they weren't really doing doing things. And I think the re- recent uh, whistleblower uh, with Meta and Instagram and 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 kids' mental health really shows that they know what's going on, but they chose not to to act. Uh, upon that. So we got to keep on putting pressure uh, and, you know, both uh, legislatively as well as our own actions to get some of these big companies to, you know, realize that this stuff is, is no longer acceptable. Yeah. I love it. Perfectly said. Thank you, Tom. This was amazing. Very eye opening. And I hope everyone like learned a lot and makes a big change in their, how they approach their relationship with technology and get the book. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Make sure to listen, follow, and subscribe for new episodes wherever you get your podcasts and on our YouTube channel.